Welcome to the Daily Grace Podcast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Crystal. We are a part of the content team here at the Daily Grace Co. And our mission is to equip disciples in the Word. And every Tuesday, we share what we're learning from Scripture with you right here on the podcast. Because we believe that deep Bible study, sound doctrine, and rich theology are not just for the seminary student or pastor, but are accessible for all believers. So whether you listen on the go or sitting down with pen and paper in hand, we hope these conversations will teach you something new about God and His Word and to remind you that the gospel changes everything. Do you have young children? If so, we want to tell you about an amazing new board book series from Abby Wedgworth and the good book company called Training Young Hearts. Training Young Hearts features four fun lift the flap books for toddlers and a brand new storybook for children over three called Your Amazing Hands. Each book in the series trains young hearts through the gospel by both showing that Jesus is our example and explaining how his grace enables us to change. We know firsthand how difficult and discouraging it can be to try to teach toddlers how to use their hands, feet, and words in a loving and kind way. The books in this series have titles like, What Are Hands For?, What Are Feet For?, and What Are Mouths For?, through colorful illustrations and engaging Lift the Flat pages. These books will help your toddlers learn how to honor God and others with their actions in a grace-filled way. Listeners can get 25% off the series with the code dailygrace at thegoodbook.com. We will link it in the show notes for you. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Daily Grace podcast. This is Crystal, and I am here with my friend and co-host, Shelby. Hey, Shelby. Hey, Crystal. Uh, We're really excited because we have with us today a really special guest, Sam Alberry. Hey, Sam. Hey, it's good to be with you. Yeah, we're so glad that you're here. So if Sam's name doesn't sound familiar to you, let me just briefly introduce you to him. He is a pastor, a preacher, a podcaster, and an apologist. He's the author of several books, including Is God Anti-Gay? What God Has to Say About Our Bodies, and the children's book, God's Signpost, How Marriage Points Us to God's Love. But today he's here to talk about his newest book, which is a book for children about God's design for marriage called God's Go Togethers. We're really looking forward to this conversation today. Sam, I know I gave like your professional bio just then, which I might have even pulled right off your website. I can't quite remember. (laughs) But I'm wondering if you could just introduce us personally to you and who you are. And one thing our listeners love to hear is what just like a normal day in your life looks like. So if you could share that with us, we'd love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a joy to be with you both. Thank you for having me on. So I'm, I'm British, as you can probably tell, but I live in America now. I moved to Nashville a few years ago. I'm working at Emmanuel Nashville Church, and I'm one of the pastors there. So that, that takes up most of my time. I don't know if there is a normal day for me. I don't really have two weeks that are identical, but when I'm around, normality normally involves working in the church office, meeting up with different members from the church, maybe having giving a talk somewhere, that kind of thing. I'm also on the road a fair bit as well. I, I do some itinerant ministry. So I just got back from a, a trip to Turkey, which was which was a real privilege to be there. So yeah, I'm glad to be back home for a few weeks and hunkered down here. Is there anything that you miss from like back home that you don't get in Nashville? Yeah, I've got to say the biggest thing, I was stopped in England on my way back from Turkey just to catch up with my parents. I just miss walking in English countryside. There's Mm -hmm. stunning countryside around here in Nashville, but you can't get to any of it because it's all privately owned by people with guns. So, um, (laughs) whereas in England, there's, I don't know how it happened, but there's there's just a lot of public footpaths in the countryside. So you could be walking along the boundary of two different farmlands, but you can be there. So I miss that. I, I would do that happily every single day of my life if I, if I could. That is a little bit different, I'm sure, in Nashville. So, well, we're really excited for this topic. It's one that we've covered in like little bits and pieces, but to have you on to speak more fully, I think it's going to be a real blessing to our audience. And it's a topic that you've talked about widely. It's something you've written on, which is the topic of sexuality. We've recommended Is God Anti-Gay on the podcast before, Mm -hmm. and we can just imagine to talk about this at length and to write about it at length can be really difficult. So we would just love to hear from you why you've chosen to tackle this topic. Yeah, there's there's lots of reasons, really. One is there's obviously a lot of confusion in our culture around these kinds of things. Certain things that might have been assumed 30, 40 years ago are now very much contested in our culture. 
the definition of marriage being one of those things. It's therefore an issue of confusion in the church as well. Lots of Christians are kind of wondering, what are we supposed to think on this? Or we think we know what we're supposed to think, but we don't know how on earth to, to kind of hold that position in today's climate. And it's something I've wanted to think through myself. Wrestling with same-sex attraction has been part of my journey as a, as a Christian. So I've had to, to think very carefully about what the Bible says about sexual ethics, about definition of marriage. And that has led to, to teaching and writing on this over the years in different ways. And one of the joys I have is, is often doing Q&A sessions at churches, hearing people's questions, concerns. And a question I keep hearing is, how do we talk to our kids about this? So that, that was really the genesis of doing these two children's books. They very much come as a set on two different aspects of our understanding of marriage as Christians. So trying to get some of those truths into into the system at a younger at a younger age. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you just kind of mentioned this because there are these greater questions in culture about the definition of marriage and then therefore that comes into the church there are questions about the definition of marriage. I think although the majority of our listeners are people who are probably engaged in a church in some way they might still have questions about what God's design for marriage is. There's just so much information flying at us. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can just kind of give us an overview before we step into how to talk to children about this. Can you just give us an overview of what God's design for marriage is? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. And it's important to the Bible as well, because this is not a, a peripheral topic in Scripture. We, we actually get our definition of marriage on page two of our Bibles. It's in Genesis chapter two, we, where we see a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So we see there a pattern of one man and one woman united in a way that is lifelong. And that's the blueprint we're given in creation. Throughout the rest of the Bible, we see how sin has distorted that. And we see the wreckage of when we go outside of that design. In the teachings of Jesus, we see that design being very much reaffirmed and unpacked as he, he kind of teaches on these things as well and, and reiterates that. And then throughout the rest of the New Testament, again, we see the same the same design reflected in the various things that we're told not to do. If sexual intimacy is designed exclusively for marriage between a man and a woman, then we see, you know, at various points in the scripture, any form of sexual intimacy outside of that context being being prohibited. So that is God's design, and it's the reason it comes so early in the Bible's narrative is because it's tied to the Bible's narrative, because we, we discover as, as the Bible unfolds that the God who has made the world and created us in his image is himself a husband, and he describes his people as his bride, and so he's embedded within human nature something of a, of a picture of this. And so marriage is, is meant to be something that points us to the gospel itself. Jesus called himself the bridegroom. So again, we, we keep seeing this, this marital dimension to our relationship to Jesus. So that's why my the earlier of those two children's books is called God's Signpost, because it, it's trying to sort of highlight that particular connection. Yeah, I, I appreciate you just laying that out. I think when we talk about this as a topic, we can make assumptions that we all have the same definitions that we're working with. So just to be able to say from the beginning, when we talk about God's design for marriage, this is what we mean as we see it throughout scripture. But I think even the second question, and I feel like we've already kind of alluded to it, is in our day and age when society and even within some Christian spheres, there's this question of, well, is that good? And is that good for me? Is God's design for marriage good? Some people might feel like, I mean, is that fair? Maybe it seems outdated or restrictive. So can you just like help us as maybe some listeners might be wrestling with those questions? How would you address that? Hmm. They are such important questions and they're, they're really understandable because in our culture today, we really prize sexual freedom. It's seen as being a, a kind of a key way we express ourselves, we fulfill ourselves, and therefore anything that places any sort of restriction on our sexual freedom seems to feel like something that's a constraint, something that is actually harmful to us. And our definition of, of marriage has changed in our culture, not just because we, we now have same-sex marriage in the UK and in the US and in many other places, but because marriage itself has become a sort of way of celebrating romantic fulfillment rather than a, a covenant between two people that is, is intended to be lifelong. So given those shifts, the Christian understanding looks more and more strange 
and more and more dangerous, actually, to, to many people. So we've got to keep coming back to not just what does the Bible say, but why does the Bible say it? And to taste and see that the Lord is good in this area of life, as in all others. And I think the blueprint helps us to do that because it, it gives us a positive vision of human sexuality. Um, it, it shows us that, that marriage in God's design is, is meant to be a unique union. It's, it's a union across difference with male and female. It's a union that is so potent that it has the potential for new life to emerge from it. And it's a, it's a union that is uniquely able to, again, form a one flesh kind of companionship and to point beyond itself to the thing that really does fulfill us, which isn't romantic fulfillment, but which is, is knowing our creator. So it is good news for us that God says what he does say about, about sex and marriage. It may not land on us as good news, but the more we walk in his ways, I hope the more we, we understand them and the more we value and, and appreciate them. That's certainly been the case for me. I can think of commands that I, I obeyed begrudgingly <laughs> early on in my Christian life, but which I now deeply cherish and, and wouldn't want the Bible to say anything other than it, it clearly says. Thank you so much, Sam, for kind of walking us through that and with so much grace and gentleness mm -hmm. too. I love, I just really appreciate that about the way that you communicate these things, which often come with lots of questions and even yeah. some concerns. Yeah. So now that we kind of have that groundwork laid, I'd love to talk about your book, God's Go Togethers. So you kind of mentioned you have, this is your second children's book. I'm wondering if you can explain how this book is different from the first children's book you wrote. And then why is it important to talk about this subject with our kids early? Sometimes I think as a parent, I feel like it would be so much easier to avoid it. But I love when I'm challenged or even taught why I should be talking about it earlier. So, yes, the, the message of this book is to show how God has designed certain things to pair together in his world. And so the, the story is about these, these kids and one of them decides they're, they're at the beach for the day. One of them decides rather than putting... I think it's rather than putting ketchup or mustard on his, his hot dog, he puts it on his donut instead and puts sugar on his hot dog or something like that. I forget <laughs> the details now. And obviously it's disgusting. And he's, he's thinking, but I like ketchup and I like donuts, but the two don't go together. And so it then leads to a, a discussion in the story about how certain things do pair. And they're at the beach because the beach is where we, we have land and sea meeting one another. There are lots of pairings that God has built into creation for our enjoyment. And one of the most significant ones is the pairing between male and female. We're, we're not the same. We're, we're gloriously different. And Genesis shows us that we, we're both made in God's image, but in with different specialisms that mean we need each other. And so that's why we, we need that interplay between male and female in, in life and in marriage and, and beyond marriage as well. So that's, that's the message of the second book. I'm, I'm really trying to think of an apologetic to young minds about why marriage is between a man and a woman. The first book was about how marriage is based on a promise. It's covenantal, and therefore it's pointing to the covenant God makes with us. But this is really trying to show that other aspects of Christian marriage, which is that it is necessarily and definitionally between a man and a woman, which is obviously very contested in our, our cultural moment. But I do, I, I was talking to someone recently, and if it's, I think this happened in the news last year or something, there was some major corporation and it became apparent that the, the board of directors was made only of men. And there was this massive outcry saying, this is wrong. You've got to have diversity. You've got to have a, a female presence in there. But I was taking that and saying, listen, if, if you think that's true of a boardroom, why would you not think it's true of a marriage? Because there is something a woman can bring that more men can't bring. And if we believe that's significant enough that we, we want that to be reflected in, in the, the kind of boardroom of a company, then how much more significant is that going to be when we take it to the most intimate human context of marriage? So this is this is really the, the four-year-old version of, of trying to, to look at that argument. And I think it's important because we don't want to be, this may be an English cricket analogy that may not translate, but we don't want to be on the back foot. We want to be on the front foot of this conversation. In other words, when, when parents say to me, when is the best time to talk to children about these things? My answer is before anyone else does because you can then set the tone, you can, you can set the framework. You're not then responding and reacting to, to someone else's agenda. You can set the agenda and you can position yourself as the authority or even better position God as the authority. And there are aspects of this that children are able to understand and, it, and it's good for them to understand. These conversations are, are coming to children much earlier than they would have done for, for many of us when we were kids. And so some parents are thinking, well, I, you know, this isn't going to come up until they're 11 or 12 or whatever it might be. 
But the fact is, these things come on the radar now much, much earlier. There may be kids who, who have friends who have two mums or something like that. And so at some point, the child is going to walk through the door and go, why does so-and-so have two mummies? Or, you know, these, these things come up. So faith is not a barrier to understanding. And the, the earlier we can normalize in age-appropriate ways these conversations, the, the less fraught and less awkward they will be if we have them later on. Being English, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert on social awkwardness. And often in our efforts to avoid awkwardness, we delay something and then and it ends up becoming more awkward because we've kept kicking the can down the road. And I think that's certainly the case with these kinds of conversations. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I think it also speaks the importance of reading God's word with kids at a young age, because our kids have experienced that if they're mm -hmm. in school and they see families that look different, ask questions, they already have a baseline to go back to. Like, well, mm. I've learned this about what, you know, a marriage looks like, but then I see this. And so we're not starting with what they're seeing on the outside. We're starting with what they see in God's word. But yeah, those, those conversations, they are awkward, but the more that we are equipped to handle them, I think the better. And one thing that I love in your book, you have a parent connection page and you quote Genesis 2:24, which says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Can you just share maybe some other passages mm. we might be able to go to in scripture as we're talking with our kids about God's creation plan? Yeah, that's the first and most foundational one, but there are many others. Not least, there are other places in the Bible where that verse is quoted. So Jesus quotes it in, in Matthew 19. So we can go there and Jesus builds his own teaching around marriage on that verse. You think of Paul quoting it in Ephesians 5 when he's talking about husbands and wives. It comes up, we maybe don't want to talk about this context to, to kids, but it comes up in 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul is talking about sleeping with prostitutes. So maybe that wouldn't be the, the best place to go in, in the family <laughs> devotionals. But there's certainly other passages, I think, where we can talk about marriage. There's Psalm 45, which is... A, the royal wedding psalm, where we get this, you know, and royal weddings are such a wonderfully evocative kind of thing anyway, because you can, can really do the imagination just goes crazy with royal weddings. But that psalm is, is talking about a royal wedding where we learn that the groom is God himself. Or we can think of passages, um, I forget where in Isaiah now, but where God says your, your maker is your husband. So lots of places, the end of Revelation, where we have the wedding supper of, of the Lamb or the New Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for a husband. So lots of places where we see reflections and implications of, of God's design for marriage. That's a really helpful list. I feel like sometimes as a parent, you might hear the argument, oh, the Bible doesn't really speak on this issue. And so you might not know where to go at all. So I think that's really helpful. You know, Sam, I'm wondering, do you have an idea of what are the some of the just common misconceptions that children might have about marriage if we don't address these things early? Well, they would be the, the misconceptions of our culture. And um, one of the big misconceptions is that marriage is, is really just about romantic fulfillment. And so because we so esteem romantic fulfillment, we, we kind of make that the kind of goal and meaning of life in our culture. Marriage is, is really a public celebration of romantic fulfillment. And it's not seen as much more than that. It's one of the reasons why as a pastor, when I get asked to officiate at weddings, which I love to do, my condition is that you, you do not write your own vows, because in, in my experience, the vows that are then written tend to miss the point of the, of the marriage ceremony. It's all about how you make me feel and how I make you feel. And I'm like, we know you guys are into each other. It's your wedding day. We don't need 17 verses of bad poetry to know you guys like each other. What we're wanting to know is what are you promising to each other? Because it, again, this is covenantal. So I think trying to, to help children see that it, it's about the promise of really radical love that reflects the promise of radical love that God has made to us in Jesus. I think that is such a, a beautiful truth for us at any age, but it's a, it's a truth a young mind can, can readily grasp. So yeah, I think that would be the, the best place to start. And, and also, again, just to, to see the value of those, the difference between men and women being a feature an essential ingredient of, of what makes marriage special, that it's in the difference that you see the, the, the beauty of God's design. This is really encouraging as a parent, I've got to say. Challenging a little bit too, but even the way you're speaking, I'm like, yeah, like I can do this. Mm -hmm. Like I can do this. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can just kind of end with some advice for Christian adults who are afraid to say the wrong thing. 
when teaching children about human sexuality. You know, we even had a moment in prepping for this podcast where we were like, man, we're afraid to say the wrong thing as we record. And so I think so many people feel that. <laughs> Do you have any advice for when we feel that? Yeah, it's a very understandable fear because a lot is a lot feels at stake in these conversations, which is why to have them over a period of time to keep revisiting it means you can kind of course correct as you go. But I think, you know, two things. One is, is to remember that parenting is by grace, just as everything else in the Christian life is by grace. We're not saved by our good parenting. Kids are not going to be saved by good parenting. And so just making sure that, that you know, you're not going to do this perfectly as a parent. God has factored that in. <laughs> Your kid is going to be saved by his grace not by your parenting expertise and slickness as a, as a Christian. And the second thing is, is to bear in mind that part of our message is, is, well, hopefully the heart of our message is grace. And so as we teach God's design and God's best for us, we need to teach that in a way that recognizes none of us by nature live up to that best. And so actually it's a good opportunity for, for Christian parents to say, Do you know, God has had to be so forgiving of us. There are times when we've got this wrong, when we've not actually honoured his design. So we, we need to make sure we don't accidentally teach God's design as, as a kind of law that we, we have to live up to, otherwise we're, we're condemned. We're, we're wanting to teach it in the framework of grace. And hopefully as, as we teach grace as parents, we are actually preaching to ourselves and remembering, oh yeah, this is all by God's grace. This is, this is not down to our, our brilliance or our eloquence or anything like that. So don't be frightened of not getting it perfectly right. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't really do anything in the Christian life. There is always more grace in Jesus than there is sin and brokenness in us. So whatever mess we might make along the way, God, God will have grace for that. Such good encouragement. I'm already tearing up. This is the part where I start to cry because we're going to start like getting into the gospel. And obviously, like this whole conversation has been rich with gospel truth and encouragement and just remembering God's goodness in the way that he has crafted us, the creation of the world. Um, and so this is a question that we love to ask all of our guests. And so here at the Daily Grace Co., we love to say the gospel changes everything. So, Sam, we would love to hear from you. What has the gospel changed for you? Well, I mean, as you say, everything. And it, it, you know, I could point to, I hope any area of my life where the gospel has changed me. I was, I was out walking around my neighborhood this morning and this is such a trivial area of life that the gospel has changed. But it's just the area I happened to notice this morning is I, I'm quicker to see the glory of God in creation. I was just looking at a tree this morning <laughs> and just, and you know, the Bible has a lot to say about trees. So trees are not not insignificant things when it comes to spiritual reality. But again, it just, I noticed that the shape of the leaves, the delicacy, the, the texture of, of the trunk, all of these things. And I just thought, God is amazing. And this God has made himself knowable. We see aspects of, of his glory as we, as we look at the world he's made. And obviously we, we get to know him in a more personal way through his revelation in Jesus and, and according to the scriptures. But that was just one area that I, I can't look at the natural world in the same way now because I now have a personal relationship with, with the natural words author. And I, therefore I read his work kind of with that knowing sense of appreciation. Wow. That was great. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's always so encouraging. And I, I'm not sure that we've ever had the same answer twice. And we've asked that question dozens of times, mm -hmm. but it's just so wonderful to see that God, the way that God works individually in each person and how the gospel truly does change every part yeah. of our lives. Uh, as you were saying that, I was looking, there's a yeah. tree right out the window <laughs> behind you. And I was like, it's so true as yeah. you were saying that. I'm looking at one out of my window over there. That's why I kept looking over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> This has been a wonderful conversation. I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the time to meet with us. We will be sure to link all the ways that people can connect with you and grab your latest book, God's Go Togethers, in the show notes. But we just want to thank you for being here today and for allowing us to pick your brain on a challenging topic. Oh, it's a joy to, to be with you. Thank you so much. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. Yes, likewise. Well, you can check the show notes for all of those links. And while you are there, you can also subscribe to the podcast newsletter to stay up to date on all things Daily Grace podcast. We'll see you next time. Bye.